Um, and West Hereford is the community that molded Noah Webster's future and is still thriving over 250 years later. As the West Hereford Historical Society, something that's very important to us is community. And so several years ago, we started hosting community conversations. We wanted to be able to provide a safe and welcoming space for West Hereford residents to talk about issues that are important to them and to the community. So thank you for joining us tonight for the first of our two-part series, Race, Religion, and Response, which is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I actually have a representative from Connecticut Humanities who put the program together for us. Dr. Frank Mitchell is Executive Director of the Amistad Center for Art and Culture. He joined the center in 2000 as the curator at large, then served as Assistant Director Curator and was recently named Executive Director. He also teaches at the University of Connecticut and held positions at Trinity and Franklin and Marshall Colleges. Frank, thank you for joining us. A lot of introduction. But yes, it's Joanne Frank Mitchell from the Amistad Center for Agriculture. And maybe equally important tonight, uh, a board member at CT Humanities. We are, and we, because of the budget and everything else, the national budget, our state budget, I'm going to share a bit about the Humanities Council just in case you're not familiar with us. We are a nonprofit affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Through programming partnerships like this one, competitive grant making, and our social media channels, we create, fund, support, and highlight cultural and educational events and advocate for the humanities. CTH is also the administrator of the Connecticut Center for the Book. That organization manages and develops content for cthistory.org promotes literature and reading through our Book Voyagers community workshops for families, and supports local museums and historical societies through STEPS Connecticut, a capacity building program run in partnership with the Connecticut League of History Organizations and Connecticut Historical Society. In 2016, in the wake of events in Dallas, Baton Rouge, Minneapolis, and beyond, people across the country <coughs> were calling for more vigorous and consequential public discussions about the persistent social, economic, cultural, and racial issues that divide our communities. The humanities have much to offer the country in this time of urgent need, and as a result, the NEH enlisted the help and talents of the State Humanities Councils to stimulate meaningful community conversations. They opened up a special grant line for State Councils to help support new or existing programs that help spur public discussions in our communities. This series is possible because of special funding from the NEH that is allowing this six-month exploration of the legacy of race and ethnicity in Connecticut. A variety of programs are scheduled from May through the fall in West Hartford, New Haven, Stamford, Waterbury, and Brock. In each city, CTH reached out and partnered with local organizations to tailor the activities and resources to each community's needs. Here, we're delighted to partner with the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society for these two programs, along with the Connecticut Council for Interreligious Understanding, the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, and the Connecticut Center for Nonviolence. Thanks for coming out tonight and participating in this new initiative. We're hoping to create spaces and opportunities for public discussions and engagement around the difficult topic of race in Connecticut, help people to find common ground, and learn from each other through conversation. 
And finally, I just want to note the staff involvement on this project, especially Lauren Miller, who was uh, invaluable in organizing this and imagining that we could do this project. So I want to salute her, as well as Scott Long, and their commitment to getting us going on these conversations. Thanks for coming. Frank, and thank you to Connecticut Communities and the National Endowment for the Humanities for funding community conversations like this. I'm now going to introduce our moderator for the night. Her name is Dr. Janet Bauer. She's Associate Professor of International Studies at Trinity College. She publishes on comparative immigrant and refugee resettlement issues and is very interested in the role of women in transforming communities in Muslim diasporas. Her current eth ethnographic work with newcomers in Harvard examines how faith-based and other nonprofit organizations contribute to building immigrant social capital and furthering incorporation. This semester, her Hartford Global Migration Lab students have established a pilot refugee youth <coughs> mentoring program at Trinity College to work with the refugee children. She also serves on Hartford's recently created Commission for Refugees and Immigrant Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bauer. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Well, we're here tonight to talk about the uh, racial, religious, and other kinds of diversities that both enrich our community and challenge it. I think our recent national events which have drawn attention to certain kinds of exclusion of people based on uh, national uh, and perhaps uh, at least indirectly religious uh, characteristics and also the attention to uh, sort of managing our borders has drawn attention <coughs> to diversity uh, but also opened up a space for us to talk about uh, different kinds of diversity <coughs> in our communities. I feel like the um, United States has had a somewhat ambivalent relationship with uh, diversity. While we are imagining ourselves as a welcoming and open place, uh, and in fact didn't uh, limit uh, entry to the country very much until the 1880s, we also at that point began to erect many different borders that excluded people primarily on either personal characteristics or sort of ethno-national origins. I don't believe we had any exclusion on the basis of countries until the recent uh, executive orders. So just very briefly, a couple of examples would be the uh, Chinese exclusion law in the late 19th century, in the 1880s, which uh, limited uh, immigrants, uh, immigration from China and um, uh, other, actually other countries in um, Asia. Um, increasing uh, limitations, for example, the national quota laws in the 1920s. Uh, we didn't really have any um, formalized documentation system for entry until 1907. We didn't have a border patrol until 1924, uh, but since the early 20th century, we began to see more and more limits placed on uh, immigration uh, and inclusion of various kinds. Of course, we had other kinds of discriminatory laws that applied to certain populations in uh, America uh, at that time. One of the paradoxes of inclusion, I think, is this notion of inclusion by exclusion. That is, groups, uh, whether they're coming to this country or already here, are often encouraged to be a part of our society by interacting with those who are like themselves. So it may be ethno-national based community organizations or religious organizations. You become a part of the American community by uh, interacting with those with whom you share some of these ethnic, national, or religious bonds. Uh, and yet this is also a kind of uh, exclusion when it comes to wider community uh, participation. Of course, uh, the United States has been very much, shaped, West Hartford and Connecticut have been very much shaped by uh, diversity and by diverse populations coming to uh, this country. Connecticut and the greater Hartford area 
reflect the major streams of immigrants and uh, newcomers uh, that have entered the United States historically. I just want to point out a few things about diversity in the greater Hartford area at the moment. Right now, West Hartford does have a uh, larger percentage of foreign-born residents than the state average, which is about 13.9%. There are about 17% of West Hartford residents are foreign-born. Uh, of course, the, in Hartford, uh, the percentage is even greater. That's about 24%. And of those foreign-born, uh, although we have a diverse foreign-born population in West Hartford, we have a higher percentage of Asian uh, Asian immigrants or foreign-born uh, members of our community than is true for either uh, Hartford or um, Connecticut as a whole. And yet we have lower percentages of Latinos and African Americans in West Hartford. So that says something about the kind of diversity uh, that we experience here. Um, we're both enriched by that, I guess, and sometimes challenged to think about how we interact with one another. Uh, we have a percentage of undocumented uh, living in the greater Hartford area. State average is about 3.5%, uh, but about 5% of our workers are undocumented. That means that immigrants and undocumented immigrants in particular are important contributors to our economy uh, as well as to our uh, communities. And within uh, Greater Hartford and West Hartford in particular, we see a great deal of religious diversity. In contemporary discourse, particularly among uh, government, um, uh, certain in government circles, there is um, a tendency to talk about the management of diversity, which is not a term that I really like. I prefer to talk about civic engagement. And one of the more controversial commentators on civic engagement and diversity was Robert Putnam. But among the more interesting things he pointed to were um, following after uh, another uh, researcher, sociologist, the four conditions of contact among people that actually contribute to reducing prejudice, prejudice and increasing understanding. And those four conditions were um, equality of status among the groups, uh, common goals or shared goals, a cooperation or willingness to cooperate, and the support of authorities, which would mean sort of government policies, laws, uh, community officials taking a stand to support uh, a certain kind of um, uh, interaction, uh, uh, stand against prejudice and discrimination. I also want to point out that uh, within uh, West Hartford and the Greater Hartford area, nonprofit organizations are the primary focal point for engaging uh, diversity in our communities. So the, the public libraries are one place where that happens. I participated um, with the Baxton Library branch in a, in a study of uh, the seven main language groups in West Hartford. It was an attempt to assess the needs and see how uh, some of the larger um, foreign born or ethno-national groups in West Hartford could be, um, could increase their participation in the community. Um, in addition, um, there are many other nonprofits, particularly faith-based organizations, one of the groups that, that I look at, who are providing a lot of services to, uh, particularly to immigrants and newcomers. So a lot of you may know that there are several faith-based coalitions in West Hartford that are supporting uh, Syrian refugee families in our community. And a lot of those uh, volunteers who are participating in these nonprofits are women uh, from our communities. So this is to, just to reiterate that a lot of our sort of um, resettlement, management of interaction and diversity does fall on the nonprofit sector and the volunteer sector to conduct that work. Tonight we're going to hear more specifically from each of our experts about the diverse racial and religious roots of West Hartford. And then I hope that in listening to them, you'll be prompted to think about questions regarding civic engagement, uh, bridging uh, between different communities, something they call bridging capital, that gets people from community, uh, diverse communities talking to each other and interacting with one another. So at this point, I'm going to uh, introduce our first panelist, Mary Donahue, who is assistant publisher of the Connecticut 
uh, Explored magazine. She has more than 50 years experience as an award-winning historian. 30, 30, sorry. 30. <laughs> 30, if I need a light over my head. I just had a birthday, so, you know. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, Mary has more than 30 years experience as an award-winning uh, historic preservationist, architectural historian, and author. She served as the Survey and Grants Director, then Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the State Historic Preservation Office of the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development from 1981 to 2012. She co-authored three award-winning publications, including most recently, A Life of the Land, Connecticut's Jewish Farmers. In 2012, she was awarded the Janet Jane Schwitt Award for Professionalism in Historic Preservation by the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation. And in 2011, the Frederick Law Homestead Award by the Connecticut Association of Landscape Architects. She serves on the Connecticut Civil War Commemoration Commission and boards of the uh, Noah Webster House and the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford. She is currently the assistant publisher, as I mentioned, of Connecticut Explored, the state's history magazine. Mary, thank you very much. Now that we have my birthday and my age straightened out, that's good. Um, I'm happy, so happy to be here, and I always learn as much or more than anybody in the audience when I serve or, or attend any of these wonderful community discussions that the No Webster House helps sponsor. So I'm very happy tonight to kick off uh, the evening with a brief 10 minute overview of West Hartford's ethnic history. I was telling Frank earlier that when you tell a historian that they have 10 minutes, my, our first reaction is we're thrilled. It's like I could do that in my sleep. Our second reaction is sheer panic because there's so much material. But I think we're gonna take a great stab at presenting the big picture for West Hartford. How many people here grew up in West Hartford? About a third of the group. So you have a longer memory than some of our audience members. Uh, but we're going to uh, look at the big picture for West Hartford's ethnic development. I did uh, bring copies of Connecticut Explored's recent civic engagement issue. There are complimentary copies on the back table and this is this issue we concentrated in just what we were talking about with civic engagement in terms of the struggle for inclusion and for equality and I also have uh, one advertisement I want to give for the Jewish Historical Society. May 21st they're doing two rounds of their bus tours of ethnic Hartford. They come, they, you get to visit and go inside three historic synagogues. You get to hear about the, intent, the development of the Front Street neighborhood, which is if you're Italian, Polish, Irish, Jewish, all of the, those ethnic groups were found in that area. That's where Constitution Plaza is now. And it's a wonderful, professionally done two-hour bus tour. So those brochures are in the back, too. So let's jump into uh, West Hartford. So uh, for tonight's conversation, uh, I was thinking about the fact that over the last few years I've been digging into the neighborhood studies and the architecture of West Hartford in preparation for a book. So, so far I've given lectures and extensively researched the east side of, of West Hartford. So that includes everything from the upscale neighborhoods that are in the golf club district down to the streetcar suburbs of Elmwood. So this was right up my alley. This is exciting ground to cover in West Hartford. There are two notable histories of West Hartford, but not a, not a modern one. And so there's a lot to, lot to look at. Uh, for more information, if you're interested on race and housing in West Hartford, I want to recommend and also acknowledge the work of Dr. Jack Doherty of Trinity College. He has an online book called On the Line, how schooling, housing, and the civil and civil rights shaped Hartford and its suburbs. And there's a lot of West Hartford material. I also want to thank our wonderful town historian, Dr. Tracy Wilson, for her work that's published in West Hartford Light. So just last month, as I was getting ready for this presentation, the town of West Hartford became the most populous town in New England, according to Patch. This is because Framingham, Massachusetts, decided to become a city. So um, whether that's fake news or real news, I'm not sure. But I would say that West Hartford certainly is a large town. We have 63, according to uh, the guesstimates in 2015 in the census, we have 63,288 residents. 
In 2010, West Hartford's population was about 79.6% white, 6.3% African American, 7.4% Asian, 9.8% Hispanic, 0.2% uh, Native American, 3.8 from other races, and 2.7 from two or more races. Of West Hartford residents, 49, over, a little over 49% are religious. Out of that group, about a third are Catholic, about 20% are Protestant, and about 3% are Muslim. Uh, the, and uh, uh, Jews represent uh, about 2.5%. So that's where we were in 2010. So let's look at our history. West Hartford's history is inexplicably, or in, not inexplicably, it's totally can be explained. It's irrelevantly tied to the city of Hartford's. The West Hartford began as a part of the outlying rural section of the parish of Hartford. It was set off as the West Division in 1672. And a total of 72 long lots were laid out between today's Quaker Lane on the east and Mountain Road on the west. Referred to as the West Division of Hartford until 1711 when it became the West Division Parish with its own congregational church. And we are right, in the, right next door to the congregational church. So as early as 1792, the people of the West Division were anxious to become a separate town from Hartford. But it wasn't until 1854 that the Connecticut General Assembly approved the creation of the town of West Hartford, and that allowed for us to have our own town government and taxation. Uh, as far as early residents, uh, early residents of West Hartford, of course, tended to be from those early founding families, English families that had come to Hartford, but there were also others. In Hartford's West Division, both enslaved and free African Americans were involved with farms, businesses, and trades. Merchants, politicians, military officers, physicians, lawyers, and a few small farmers owned enslaved people. Bristol, for whom Bristol School is named, was in the 1770s enslaved to Thomas Hart and Sarah Whitman Hooker on their prosperous farm on Four Mile Hill. Now that's the big white colonial house on the southeast corner of Britain Avenue and South Main Street that the DAR maintains as house museum. We're lucky to have not only his home remaining to tell us a little bit about his life, but his manumission papers, which are the legal documents showing that he actually bought his freedom, he was not given his freedom, and his will also survives. He's buried here at Center Cemetery, and as his gravestone states, he was a native of Africa. And in a surprise twist, his will leaves his estate to the children of his former owners. West Hartford remained a predominantly rural town throughout the 19th century, with a population of 1,296 in 1860, and then by 1900, it had only, only gone up to 3,186. Uh, new religious congregations, the Baptists, the Quakers, Ang Anglicans, and Sw uh, Swedish Methodists built churches in West Hartford in the 19th century. But West Hartford was about to change at the beginning of the 20th century. As all the open tracts of land be in Hartford began to be filled up with new homes for workers at all economic levels, the push across the city line on Prospect Avenue to West Hartford accelerated. Large homes for the wealthy followed the move of the Hartford Golf Club to the Prospect and Asylum Avenue area after 1900. Small farms along trolley and streetcar lines on Farmington Avenue, Park Road, and New Britain Avenue allowed for streetcar suburbs to fill with homes that could be sold to both mill managers at Travelers, as well as unionized employees at Royal Typewriter, or a dozen other industrial plants in the Parkville and Elmwood neighborhoods. This was the wild west of West Hartford suburban development. The Hartford Current reported that hundreds of building permits were issued in West Hartford, over 300 in 1922 alone. But as Dr. Doherty's work relates, in 1924, during this early phase of mass suburbanization, West Hartford became the first Connecticut municipality to enact zoning regulations to manage residential, commercial, and industrial land use. The original report stated that West Hartford's primary function was to serve the housing needs of, quote, all classes and all grades of economic ability, including factory workers, office employees, and the various business and professional groups, unquote, who work in Hartford. 
but it also separated town residents by wealth and excluded others who could not afford to live here. Zoning policies created residential districts with minimum lot sizes to promote more expensive single-family homes, thus making multifamily housing like triple-decker <coughs> or stack duplexes uneconomic to build without expressly forbidding them. New European ethnic groups began to move into West Hartford, and for the first time, Catholic churches were erected, with St. Bridget's Church in Elmwood dedicated in 1918 and St. Thomas the Apostle in 1926. Catholic institutions in West Hartford, founded by the Sisters of Mercy, an Irish-American order, include St. Mary's Home for the Aged in 1880, Mount St. Joseph Academy Girls Boarding School, 1908, St. Agnes Home for Unwed Mothers in 1914, and its biggest jewel, the University of St. Joseph, a college for women founded in 1932. Following what historians used to call the triple melting pot, separate Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish institutions were founded. Hartford Hospital, for example, in Hartford was founded in 1854, and although it was willing to take care of Catholic patients, it limited its doctors to, with privileges to Protestants. St. Francis was founded in 1892 and extended privileges to Catholic doctors, and Mount Sinai Hospital, founded in 1923, offered Jewish doctors privileges. In West Hartford, much the same practice extended to the three country clubs. The Hartford Golf Club was founded in 1896, served Protestant members. Tumblebrook Country Club, founded in 1922, served Jewish members and Wampanoag Country Club, founded in 1924, served Catholic members. Temple Beth Israel was the first Jewish congregation to construct a synagogue in Hartford in 1876 on Charter Oak Avenue. And it was the first to construct a new building in suburban West Hartford in 1936. It led an exodus from the center city to the suburbs by Jewish congregations in general. Their landmark West Hartford building is on Farmington Avenue. Jews began moving into West Hartford before this, as shown by the house at 36 Beverly Road, a Mediterranean villa built in 1917 for Gustav Fischer, president of the Gustav Fischer Office Supplies Company. After World War II, the Jewish community continued to move across the Hartford-West Hartford line into single-family homes constructed in the northern half of town, and numerous Jewish congregations moved into new West Hartford houses of worship. Dr. Doherty's work has also documented efforts to discourage African Americans from purchasing housing in West Hartford. As with many communities, restrictive covenants and property deeds prohibited the sale and occupancy of the building to anyone not of the white race, with the exception made for domestic servants of a, di of a different race. If you go to Dr. Doherty's site on uh, the, um, the University of Connecticut's magic, which is our mapping site, and look it up in the book. He's actually gone and had uh, students research and pull out the actual deeds in West Hartford Town Hall that have this type of racial restriction clearly stated. And there's there, right now there are push pins on the interactive map that you can follow up on. So there were certain subdivisions that clearly had this language in it. Subdivision language and restrictions normally includes things like how, how big a house has to be, certain uh, sizes on the lot, certain setbacks from the street. It could include things like uh, how many, uh, where the garage could be. Those are also normal subdivision restrictions, but these racially uh, charged ones were definitely common, and this is throughout the, the country. When I worked in Detroit, for example, we found these in almost every 20th century subdivision until 1950. So in, in West Hartford, restrictive covenants and the property deeds that prohibited the sale and occupancy of a building to anyone that was not of a white race, with the exception for domestic servants of a different race, exist. We've also started to research whether there are any written restrictive covenants affecting <coughs> Uh, Jews and purchases of, of homes in West Hartford, and we haven't seen that in writing yet. These racial restrictions were commonly inserted into property, property deeds, but were ruled by the U.S. Supreme Court as unenforceable in 1948. In 1942, when West Hartford was awarded funds from the U.S. government to build temporary housing for defense workers during World War II, the West Hartford Housing Authority, a town body, attempted to block African Americans from renting the units. 
Federal authorities eventually did require West Hartford to allow African Americans, but town leaders made the requirements so restrictive that black workers ultimately were barred. Until the 1970s, African American homeowners were steered to Bloomfield by real estate agents, as documented in a 1973 case by the U.S. Department of Justice that charged seven major real estate companies with what's called steering, which is where you suggest to someone, to a property owner, that they would feel more comfortable in this community or they ought to look for housing in this community. Nowadays we go to Zillow and we just can see everything about every inside property that you want to see right in your living room. But at that time, it required a real estate agent to show you properties. And so steering is this idea that they're going to suggest to you where you're going to feel the most comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so the US, in 1973, the US Justice Department won a case against seven major real estate firms in West Hartford and Hartford on this issue of steering African Americans uh, to Bloomfield instead of either Avon or uh, West Hartford. Until really until the 1880s, West Hartford was virtually an all-white community. Now, over the recent years, West Hartford's churches and synagogues have been instrumental in helping diversify West Hartford. In the 1970s, church groups sponsored Vietnamese refugees for resettlement, and in the 1980s, synagogues sponsored Russian Jews. An interfaith coalition led the fight for the construction of affordable housing beginning in the 18, 1980s, and several housing units were constructed after considerable litigation. Affordable housing continues to be a hot button with recent complaints that affordable housing units should have been required in Blueback Square as part of the favorable agreement made between developers and the town. This has also come up this year in relation to the town's approval for the redevelopment of the convent property on the corner of Park Road and Prospect Avenue into 320 apartments. At this time, there's no town requirement for affordable units to be included in any, any of these types of developments. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that I've probably missed some important events in this world in overview, but I'll turn it over to our next speaker. Dr. Schmidt is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council for Interreligious Understanding. He was the Senior Minister at Center Congregational Church in Manchester from 1999 to 2010 and served in 2015 as the Interim Executive Director of MARC. Before that, he was Project Director of the Program for Nonprofit Organizations at Yale University. He is a past member of the West Hartford Board of Education and the Capital Region Educational Council. Reverend Schmidt has degrees from Yale University, Eden Theological Seminary, and Brown University. He and his family have lived in West Hartford since 1999. Actually, 1996, uh, but that's okay. But that's not what's written here. <laughs> <laughs> so that must be true, so, so I guess I've lived here from 1999. Um, and that's important because I love West Hartford, and that's uh, um, and I have ever since I've moved, ever since my family's been here. And one of the reasons has been uh, the incredible diversity uh, that, that we found here, much more so than in the kind of place where I grew up. Um, so I'm going to uh, start off with a story um, uh, that just to remind you, the, the whole point of what I have to say and share with you tonight is is no one really as erudite or detailed as you presented, which is wonderful, um, uh, wonderful material and important material. Um, but uh, the point that I'm going to make, which I think you actually did pretty well without me, is that religion and antagonisms between religion have had a very serious and real effect on our housing patterns and on our behaviors. Um, that's a simple point, um, and it should be obvious, except if you ask your children, or for some of us, our grandchildren, if you ask them about that, they would look at you as if you had grown another head, because that hasn't been their experience anywhere nearly the degree that it uh, has for us. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story um, that maybe many of you know. Looking at you. First of all, uh, I'm looking out at, the, at everybody, and I'm saying, this is a story about Barry Goldwater. 
And I thought, you know, if we had enough bunch of young people here, they wouldn't know who Barry Goldwater was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not going to have that problem tonight. I think everybody in this room remembers Barry Goldwater. Um, so Barry Goldwater was married in an Episcopal church to an Episcopal woman. Uh, after Barry Goldwater died, he was buried in an Episcopal cemetery uh, in uh, Arizona. Uh, he wasn't a very religious person. Uh, once, when asked about his religious attendance, he came up with a, an answer that would have pleased any Unitarian, uh, certainly. Uh, but his last name, Goldwater, had been uh, changed by his grandfather, paternal grandfather, from Goldwasser, uh, and his paternal side was Jewish. So Barry Goldwater was half Jewish. Um, not something that I knew growing up uh, about him, but uh, it was, and other people did know, and other people cared, and it mattered, and I guess that's the bottom line for me. It mattered uh, to people in ways that I hope we all find appalling. Um, so the, the, the reality of the world in which Barry Goldwater grew up and was a senator, again, this is almost impossible to believe today, uh, but as a senator, um, Barry Goldwater was denied access to the, I believe it was the Congressional Golf Club, the main golf club in Washington, D.C. And he was denied access because it was a place that was, as they said in the day, restricted. Uh, and Jews were not allowed to become members. And he once, and one in, I mean, he's certainly not politically my fan, uh, I'm not a fan of him, but uh, his sense of humor is worthwhile. He once uh, looked at the director and he said, look, I'm only half Jewish. Can I play nine holes? <laughs> the answer, unfortunately, was no. Uh, and, and I tell that story, and I told that story to my children because I want them to understand that uh, America's attitudes is, towards its varied religions has um, not always been a happy one, and it has had some very real consequences. Um, and you did a wonderful job. I had listed out all of the same things that you had. Well, I've got one more uh, example um, that, uh, that made a difference. And it's a difference that we still live with today. Hartford Hospital was the Protestant hospital. And it was not about the people that necessarily went there as patients, but it certainly was about the staff uh, and the physician. Uh, and that led to St. Francis Hospital, which led to Mount Sinai, which is now, um, intriguingly enough, now is a campus of St. Francis Hospital. Um, but uh, here was uh, written out in the healthcare delivery system of our region uh, religious intolerance, uh, which had a very real effect. And then same deal, um, Hartford Country Club, Wampanoag, and Tumblebrook. Um, I actually had that backwards. I may get this wrong. I thought Wampanoag was the Jewish one and the Tumblebrook was the no. I don't know. Okay. All of those conferences of the Democratic Town Committee that I went to at Montemont, I thought for sure. All right. so, so one other one, and this was uh, an observation shared by, um, by Harry Captain, who uh, cared a lot about the demographics uh, as he ran for uh, various offices in this town. Uh, he said that our housing patterns in West Hartford as well follow a very similar pattern, that there was a Protestant area of uh, of West Hartford, and that is West Hartford Center. I see you nodding your head. You guys should be up here doing this rather than me. You probably lived here longer than I have. So there was a Protestant area, the center. There was a Jewish area, which I'm reasonably sure was the reservation, what we now call the reservation. And there was a Catholic area, which is the area up by Hall High School. I'd add a fourth area. Those three are, are fairly obviously uh, religious or ethno-religious. But there also was Elmwood, and Elmwood was the immigrant uh, area. It was the place where um, the newcomers were uh, um, relegated to, or uh, what was your word from it? Yeah, if they could afford to live there, right. Well, that's right, they could afford to live there, but it was the only place that they were shown by the real estate agents. Um, so my, my organization, the Connecticut Council for Interreligious Understanding, um, 
is made up of nine different religions, all of which are extant in Connecticut today. So not only the, the big, well, the, the, actually, of the three that we mentioned, Protestant, Jews, and Catholics, um, that would only count for two in my organization because both the Protestants and the Catholics are Christian and that only gets one seat at our table. Uh, so we have uh, Protestants, uh, and we have Christians, we have Jews, we have Muslims, we have Hindus, uh, we have Sikhs, we have Buddhists, we have Baha'i, we have Unitarians, Jains, thank you. We have Jains, Carol, am I missing anybody else? No, that's it? Okay, good, I got all nine. Um, and I, what, I would, um, what I would mention to us is that uh, a number of my, uh, organ, my religions and people from those religions are right at the moment scared. Um, and angry. They're certainly angry um, about the current political cl climate because they don't feel as welcome as they did even a short time ago. But they're also scared uh, because almost all of the religions that you wouldn't consider part of the big three are made up of people who are immigrants. And the immigrants are feeling under attack. They're feeling threatened at this point in time. And I think they have very good reason. Um, I've been down to the uh, Berlin Mosque where uh, a group of people have been gathering uh, to talk about some of the fears. And some of the things that have been discussed in that include some very real activity currently, not by our immigration and naturalization people, but instead by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, which has been going around to a number of um, religious houses of worship and making inquiries that are um, very disquieting to our people. And it's interesting because the Muslims, of course, are very concerned because they're all afraid that, uh, that people will accuse them of being terrorists. The Sikhs, on the other hand, are all terrified because they're afraid they're going to be accused of being Muslims. Um, uh, uh, something that, by the way, has prompted them to run a bunch of advertising on, uh, I believe, a number of radio stations and television stations that just started this week. Not all of the things that have gone on in uh, our history have been uh, bad uh, or um, exclusionary. Um, you mentioned the, the movement of Temple, uh, well, Congregation Beth Israel out to West Hartford in 1936. Um, one of the first things that Beth Israel did, and it's a sign of uh, maybe an attempt to be accepted, but it was also a, a way to be accepting. Um, the church that you mentioned down there, uh, First Church Congregational, burned down in 1941. Um, and uh, what the Congregation of Beth Israel did uh, in response to that was they said, hey, we're not using this place on Sunday mornings. You can come and worship here. And so in, back in that day, 1941, uh, for a year and a half, uh, the congregation uh, at First Congregational Church uh, worshiped it at uh, Congregation Beth Israel uh, without a dime, without paying a dime for uh, a long period of time, simply out of goodwill between religions um, and religious congregations and people of faith. That is the kind of thing I will admit that my organization tries to uh, promote. What I will say as well is that the uh, conflicts that religions become one way of exacerbating uh, are not limited to that. And I sort of go back with a sociological view to, um, to Durkheim's dilemma, which is that we have a tendency uh, as human beings to separate ourselves out into an us and a them. And it always seems to revolve around what we notice about the us that we can notice in an antagonistic way towards a them. So religion certainly has been a serious factor in that uh, reality, uh, especially because, uh, divert here, because religion uh, by its very nature can have an exclusionary aspect to it, and it still does in many aspects, in many, many religions, many uh, types of uh, adherence to religions. Uh, they grow up with the notion of we've got it together, we're right, we know the pathway to God, and you don't is inherent in that. When they, when, as soon as you say we know the pathway to God, there is almost an inevitable and you don't that goes along with that. Uh, and, and the more uh, 
I'll call them conservative religions, that isn't always the best term, but the more exclusionary a religion it is, the more likely it is to do that and then um, create an us and a them that leads to these separations and antagonisms. But it doesn't have to be just religion. It can be race, it can be ethnicity, it can be economics, it can be educational level, it can be location, and in my friends, I mean, you could go out to all sorts of levels of triviality. It can even be uh, something as simple as which sports team we follow. Uh, as I say, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, there was a very real antagonism between Cubs fans and White Sox fans. And in fact, you literally had to name uh, that almost as soon as you walked into a room with new people. Are you for the Cubs or are you a Sox fan? Uh, I, uh, I look out at a Board of Education member who's sitting in the audience right now, and I uh, am reminded that when I was on the Board of Education, uh, and we were interviewing new candidates for the superintendent, this is a while ago, this isn't the current superintendent, uh, this is the one before that, and our opening question, and it was really meant to throw people off base, and just to see who they were and how they could handle it, our opening question to them was, okay, Red Sox, or Yankees, and they had to answer that. Um, so, uh, um, uh, I, I am part of an organization um, that believes that the more that we talk with one another, uh, the more that we try to understand one another, the more that we relate to one another, the less likely we are to harm one another. Um, that's sometimes difficult if you come from a place of exclusion, um, it's sometimes difficult if uh, you are afraid. Um, so we try to do that. So this is anticipating question here. Uh, but it try, it, we try to prevent, we try to create events where people have the opportunity to talk and relate to one another in a low tension environment. So what do people notice today? Uh, is it race? Is it religion? Is it economics? Is it education? Well, I'm not sure. Um, is it uh, gender? Is it gender identity? Is it uh, uh, disabilities? It could be a whole bunch of things, uh, I suppose. I suspect it is less, uh, at least of what we might look at as historically significant or traditional uh, ways of separating ourselves, but there are still ways that we do it, and that's the tension that, uh, that we live in today. So, thank you. Third panelist is Megan Clark Torrey, and you probably know her as the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Uh, Megan is the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council, and in her position, she's responsible for producing uh, world-class programming and helping to enhance the community's understanding of global affairs. Uh, Megan has successfully expanded the outreach and breadth of the World Affairs Council, uh, Connecticut's model United Nations program, which I think some of my students actually participated or helped to organize last summer. Uh, the program now includes the participation of over 35 high schools and reaches more than 800 students in Connecticut every year. Her research interests include, um, uh, include inclusive security, the role of women in post-conflict situations, and citizen participation in foreign policy. Thank you. Um, and I can add, I have lived in West Hartford. Well, I don't now, I have. So I, <laughs> I do love West Hartford. Um, I think I, I have a, a really fun job tonight, and I thank everyone for having me here. Um, I get to talk about immigrants and their, um, their impact on our community. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if you were listening. Um, so Janet said it before, but uh, what the, what, uh, roughly what percentage of our population in this region is um, a foreign born? So in Connecticut, 13.9, but as Janet said, it is higher in West Oregon. Yep. Exactly. How many, um, what percentage of households in the state of Connecticut uh, speak a language other than English at home? It's, it's roughly uh, uh, 22%. So what does that mean? I think that means that our state is a very global one. 
So Connecticut also has three official consulates. So governments from other countries have invested time and money and real estate and staff to be here in Connecticut to operate official consulates. I'm gonna ask you another question. Does anyone know what those consulates are? Yes. Oh. No. I know she, I think she got it. Did you get it? So we have Brazil, Ecuador, which is in New Haven, and the third? So the third is Peru. And so what that means is that there are, there's enough population in Connecticut from those countries for Peru and Brazil and Ecuador to invest in staff and invest in our state. Um, and it speaks to the diversity that those populations bring us. Uh, we live in a richly diverse community that benefits from our immigrant and refugee populations. As a leader of a community organization here in this region, my organization thrives in a diverse and welcoming environment. Our community is stronger because we're diverse. Immigrants and refugees are an integral part of the fabric of who we are as people. Um, so across the state, as Janet pointed out, uh, we've seen a uh, shift in our immigration patterns, mostly uh, a large increase, especially in West Hartford and Asian population. And the reasons behind uh, immigration are what one would expect. Um, so of course, following all global trends in population um, increase, lack of economic opportunity and educational opportunity from where they are. Um, I know uh, we have discussed some of these, so just over the last hundred years, what we've experienced here in Connecticut um, is in the 1930s, the collapse of the sugarcane industry in the West Indies brought a large number of immigrants into our communities. Um, during the 1940s, uh, during World War II, we saw the buildup of our aviation industry here in Connecticut and the call for, um, for labor, and that also saw an increase, which actually uh, is true to today, um, where we do have a large aerospace industry and a, large, and a, a number of immigrants working on, in that industry. So you may know, um, which is an interesting statistic, so uh, any airplane that's flying today, 70% of their component parts are made here in Connecticut. So, of course, the Immigration Act of 1965, after that we saw a lot of um, increase in immigration, and then in the 1970s, as was previously discussed, we saw increasing immigration from Vietnam, Vietnamese and Russians, and of course Cubans. Um, and then one of the most important things I'd like to point to, because uh, as a community we benefit from this so much, is the Refugee Act of 1980 which allowed those fleeing persecution for their race, their ethnicity, nationality, religion, and political views to come to our country and resettle. And in, in our region, of course, you know, over the 1990s and the 2000s and until today, we uh, have a lot of Bosnian, Afghani, Burmese Karin, Somali Bantu, Iraqi, and uh, sadly now a lot of Syrian refugees. I hope that will continue. Um, but what I thought I would do today to, to give you an example of what an impact immigrants make on our community is tell you the story of some immigrant immigrants. So every year I'm really, really lucky. I'm the treasurer of the Connecticut Immigrant and Refugee Coalition. And in the spring we get um, we have a day called Connecticut Immigrant Day where we honor about 15 immigrants that have moved to our communities and made a really big impact. And that day was yesterday. It uh, coincidentally, you know, coincided with that big rally. But um, every year we get to hear the stories of amazing people that are doing amazing things and making our community better. So if you'll permit me, I want to tell you the stories of, stories of about five of them. So um, a West Hartford resident, Gisela Adamski, who is originally from Germany, born in 1928, Gisela was raised under an oppressive Nazi regime that restricted her family's rights because of their Jewish heritage. Her family was separated through a series of transfers to different ghettos and camps across Poland and Germany, during which time her father was murdered and her mother disappeared. Gisela was living at Kurzbach labor camp in January 1945 when the Allies breached Germany's defenses. She was taken on a death march and after five days, 
was rescued by a Polish Christian man who hid them and 42 other women until the Soviet army liberated them. Gisela then married a Polish Jewish soldier named Mr. Adamski and then moved to Paris, where their child, Eleni, was born. They briefly moved to Tel Aviv, Israel, before settling in Queens, New York in 1956. Gisela joined the local chapter of a Holocaust survivors um, organization as a board member, and then she worked um, at Gage Collaboration Laboratory for 27 years, part of which was spent leaving the factory following her boss's death. At age 84, she earned her high school degree in Hartford from Hartford High. At age 85, she survived cancer. Today, she contributes to the world around her home in West Hartford by speaking about her struggles and the truths of what she faced so many years ago. Anwar Hussein, originally from Bangladesh. Following the end of British rule in India in 1950, Anwar moved to East Pakistan, now known as Bangladesh, where he received his BA in architecture from a local university and worked for world-renowned architect Louis Kahn. In search of higher learning, Anwar traveled to the United States, where he earned an MA in architecture from Syracuse University in New York. Anwar's plan was to return to his home country, but it was prevented by war for, the East, uh, for East Pakistan's independence. Stuck in the US, he eventually made his way to Hartford, where he met and married his wife, Diana. The biggest challenge for Anwar was the internal struggle between his obligation to help Bangladesh recover from the war and his hopes for his future here in the United States. After choosing the latter, Anwar was blessed with two sons and two grandchildren and has worked on over 5,000 projects over the course of his life in the United States. His greatest contributions to society include four nationally recognized schools, his dedication towards community organizations such as Habitat for Humanity, the East Harvard Rotary Club, Catholic Charities, and his establishment of Muslim houses of worship in cemeteries that Connecticut was lacking. Ida Mansour. Now, how many know any one that I've mentioned so far? See what a big impact immigrants are having on our community. So Ida Mansour. Ida earned a BS uh, joint honors in psychology and biochemistry at King's College in London before marrying and moving to the United Kingdom. While in the United while in the United States, she earned an MS in community health at California College of Health Sciences in Bethlehem, Connecticut, when her husband started an internship at UConn Health Center in Farmington. Since then, Ida has been working to bridge the cultural divide between the United States Muslim community and fellow Americans. Her presentations on understanding Muslims and her community work towards solving domestic issues has earned her various accolades, including the Human Relations Award from the National Conference for Community Injustice, the Public Service Award from the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, and the Terry Prize, a Certificate in Islamic Chaplaincy, and an MA in Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations from Harvard Seminary. Her Muslims Against Hunger team in Food Chair's annual walk has raised over $25,000 in the past years. I just held the position as the, as the president of the Muslim Coalition of Connecticut between 2011 and 2016. Uh, I'm going to tell you about Alyssa Sizek, who I had known for years and didn't know her story until yesterday. Alyssa is from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Between the ages of 9 and 17, Alyssa lived in Germany as a refugee from the Civil War in her home country. The carnage that left little of her family and little of their old life intact. So she moved to the United States in 2000 with help of Catholic charity. She earned a BA from the University of St. Joseph in West Hartford and an MS in communications from Central State at CCSU. Alyssa worked in the field of marketing and communications for 10 years, eventually leading her in her current job, uh, leading her to her current job as manager uh, of marketing and public relations for the Connecticut Airport Authority. Um, and I have one more for you. Priyama Natarjaran, born and raised in India, Priyama traveled to the United States for higher education and earned a BS in physics and a BS in mathematics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Cambridge. She currently works as a theoretical astrophysicist at Yale University in New Haven and has greatly contributed to current scientific knowledge about dark matter and the formation and growth of black holes. She has been published in the Washington Post 
She's been on CNN, has written for the Huffington Post, and has her own book, Mapping the Heavens. Her position as a woman within the scientific field has led her to advocate for gender equality in STEM education <coughs> and in the workplace. Um, she's also worked with the Yale Law School and organizing uh, conferences that focus on gender parity. So I want to thank you for listening to those because I can talk about the important impacts that immigrants make on our communities all day long. But until you actually hear what they're doing and learn the stories of how they're impacting us in all of our communities, I think that really makes a big difference. And um, you know, I'll let their stories speak for themselves. Thank you. So we've reached the part of the program which is called a moderated discussion. And I'm going to try to keep it to 20 minutes since we're running a little late and ask the panelists to keep their remarks somewhat brief. But I have a series of questions and then we're going to open it up for Q&A from the audience. Maybe you'll take it in a, in a very different direction. Uh, but um, as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of work on um, how civic engagement, particularly structured uh, activities, can promote greater understanding and reduce prejudice if those programs are available. <coughs> and that's not to undercut the, the ways in which uh, other factors, like the reception society, um, the you know, institutional or lack of institutional support, structural factors can affect this as well. But I want to ask each of the panelists, um, either historically or contemporary times, what um, their research or their organizations do to promote um, some kind of engagement across different groups, people going outside of their own groups. And whether in this particular era, in the last couple of years, or in the last 10 years, um, there has been uh, you know, a, any pushback, or is there a positive response? What is the response from the public to the programs that you're providing? Sure, I'll start quickly and I'll try and keep it brief. But um, I know at the World Affairs Council we talked about our Maui United Nations program, which last year hit a thousand students. Um, this, those thousands, among those students, are a large portion of refugees. A large, we have about 25% uh, are immigrants. Um, and this is a large number of students that come together and share information and, share and learn different perspectives. And I can't think of anything more important engaging our youth in different perspectives and getting to understand uh, and stand in someone else's shoes. And to me, that's one of the most important work that we do. And quite opposite, we haven't had any pushback. Um, over the last five, five years, we've gone from 400 students to 1,000. So what we see is students that know they're global citizens and want to engage in the world. Um, uh, our organization, uh, Connecticut Council for Interreligious Understanding, is sort of dedicated to doing exactly what uh, we're talking about here, which is getting people to talk to one another, getting people to understand one another. Um, we do a number of different kinds of things. I will highlight one, and then I'm going to go to a different institution completely and, and use it as an example. Um, one of the things that we do, uh, as some of you know, is uh, events throughout the state called Honest Conversation with Muslim Neighbors. Um, and we set up uh, events in a variety of settings. They've been in churches, they've been in uh, synagogues, we've had them in libraries, we've had them on a couple college campuses. Um, and basically, we invite people to come and ask questions of folks who happen to be Muslim. Uh, almost all, but not all, almost all are uh, immigrants. Um, and we give them the opportunity to ask the kinds of questions that they probably have in their minds, but probably haven't had the opportunity to actually ask a real live Muslim. Because the reality is that the majority of Americans have never even met someone who's a Muslim, or at least uh, don't know whether they have or not. And so we make this kind of a public forum. We manage it uh, carefully, and it works out very well, partly because Janet Bauer is often our uh, moderator of these events. Um, I will say that we have had pushback. Um, in fact, we've had the, the, one of the realities for us is that, that because we're doing something that's very public and is uh, out there and is visible, 
Uh, we sometimes have wonderful, wonderful turnout. We had 160 people at, at uh, Congregation Beth Israel in the middle of a snowstorm uh, in January this year. It was just incredible. We were very, very impressed with that. But because it's that popular and that successful, the people who are Islamophobes, the people who are afraid of Muslims, have also come out and have also, as a matter of fact, written letters to churches urging them not to uh, allow us to have their uh, our, our experiences at those places, um, at their places of worship. Um, so there has been pushback, um, and we're aware of it. And uh, so I, I, I do want to emphasize that uh, religious antagonism is still uh, very much a part of the landscape of Connecticut. I do want to say one more thing. Uh, it's a different institution, um, which is our public schools. Um, our public schools are all about education, and they oftentimes afford the opportunity to teach the students about each other. And sometimes it's an accidental kind of thing. I watched a principal, school principal, ask his students um, how many of them were celebrating Diwali. Diwali is a, a Hindu and Jain um, holiday. And it comes, at, well, at that year, it came right around the time of Veterans Day. And this is in one of the schools in West Hartford. And there were 30 or so children in elementary school who raised their hands and said they were, their family was celebrating Diwali that night. Well, that's a teaching moment that can happen, that does happen, and did happen in that school. And I think that does go on in our uh, schools here in West Hartford in a lot of uh, situations. You might say to yourself, what does history have to do with current affairs? Well, it has everything to do with current affairs, and it really illuminates current affairs. One of the things I'm proudest of this year at Connecticut Explored is that we have started a project where we're developing a third grade curriculum. It's a beautifully designed booklet. It's going to have all kinds of information about things like geology and, and trees and all kinds of other state symbols. but. Something that really helped us crystallize our, our dedication to this project and to developing a guide for children that's going to really explain Connecticut, their home state to them in a very factual way was that there, is a, there was a, a curriculum being used in Norwalk where slavery was described as a very benign, friendly institution and that they were, because they were, we were in Connecticut, slaves were treated well and they were treated like family members. Well, we dispute that <laughs> as historians and um, letters were written to the <laughs> editor, that book has been pulled, um, the um, Hartford Current did an editorial about it and it's that kind of very um, whitewashing <coughs> of history that we try to uh, work against and really tell the story, which is always more inspiring and, um, and more deeply felt than these uh, oversimplifications. So I, I think Connecticut Explored, we're dedicated to unearthing stories that communicate how things got the way they are today, what people did about them, and how we can go forward with that information. Um, in response to both Megan and um, Terry, I just want to point out one thing, which is that um, some of the research suggests that knowing um, people from other religious backgrounds can sort of reduce your um, sort of prejudice or bias against them. And that works for most um, religious, people of different religious backgrounds, but when it comes to people people's reception of Muslims, it doesn't work quite as well. Although there's some evidence if you know one Muslim, it sort of does begin to change your, uh, or to sort of open you up to less prejudice. But it, uh, the interaction and understanding and relationship doesn't work quite as strongly as it does with some other um, religions. And I wanted to ask a question about generations, since we're mostly of one generation here, but Megan addressed that commenting on the um, participation of young people and uh, Terry mentioned the things they take for granted in terms of uh, acceptance. But I want to ask a harder question because as someone who lives in a household with, with non-white people and has lived in West Hartford for over 30 years, I have had experiences of discrimination 
And I wanted to ask if any of your programs or sort of efforts really do address racial discrimination or discrimination on the basis of race. Because we talk about religion and immigrant diversity. One of the things I see with the refugees and immigrants that I work with is we never quite explain to them how race works in America, and yet they encounter that in schools. Kids are bullied. Um, they have these experiences they're not expecting. So do you address that in the model you in or in textbooks or in um, the CCIU? Well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make it easy and say no. Uh, we don't. Um, only implicitly, uh, our focus is on, on uh, religion. Um, it, it comes up as a part of the package. People talk about uh, the differences that, that they experience because of their skin tone or because of their uh, uh, dress or some of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But it is not an explicit part of what we do. I just I think in our publishing we really try to as I said dig deep and look for stories that are going to convey what people have gone through in the past and in facing things like racial discrimination. Uh, we make we published a book called uh, African American Connecticut Explored and Dr. Mitchell is one of the co-authors for that and our publisher is here Elizabeth Norman and that really tried to develop not only the broad context of uh, African Americans in our state, but very detailed, fine grained stories that tell of the prejudice and discrimination they encountered and their strategies for coping with that are succeeding. And I think that's, that's where we can contribute in really inspiring work mm -hmm. to people that are facing that today. So I would say that at the council, we don't necessarily directly address the issues of um, we work globally to, uh, to sort of work with our students, work with our audience to understand multiple perspectives and to really think about um, issues in, in, in global, globally, but, but from different perspectives to be, you know, more accepting of other people's ideas and who other people are. Um, so I guess perhaps indirectly, but not explicitly. So I want to just add one more question. Um, backing on the other question about whether in your program you take in the issue, take in, not only take into account the perspectives of people who are different in terms of religion or race or immigration status, but do you actually have them on your boards or on in your um, you know, committees mm -hmm. that make decisions about how to um, create activities? Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, that is our board. Uh, so, so yes, we have, uh, you know, the whole point of our board is diversity, and actually um, that is written into uh, the organizational scope uh, uh, that a certain number of people are allowed and no more than a certain number. So all nine religions we hope are represented. Um, uh, not all of them have a full contingent, but uh, but when we get to a certain level, we have, there, there are religions we have to say, sorry, we don't have room for you right now, to make sure that there is a wide representation uh, and not an over representation. I would say, you know, as both a board member of the Noah Webster House and the Jewish Historical Society, we, we seek to, those organizations really reach out and partner with a wide range of community groups over the course of a year or two and really tell a lot of diverse stories, whether it's through food or whether it's through dance or whether it's through art. Um, all of those are ways that we partner with different communities that are in this current group. So at the World Affairs Council, who is at our table is really important to us. Uh, we want our organization to be representative of what our community is. Uh, it's something we strive for, it's our goal, uh, and I think we do a pretty good job, um, and we hope to continue to do a good job. Thank you. I want to open up discussion to the audience because there are so many different ways in which we could take our discussion with respect to different kinds of diversity, do certain questions about immigration at the moment. Um, so I'm not quite sure if you need microphones or Just yell. for everyone to hear. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just want to say that I think that 
do a deep voice because I'm a teacher. And I want to say that because, of course, I believe that talking and teaching are absolutely crucial. And I think all of your groups are wonderful. Um, I, I do know that. I'm just wondering about the limits of talking. And again, this is not about your groups, which I understand are the designs as they are. But I wonder if you might reflect a little bit about the um, systematic ways, institutional ways, in which uh, discrimination still happens. So, for example, you can refer to the, um, that we don't do restricted housing companies anymore, but we still don't have a mandate in West Hartford to set aside a certain number of housing for low income people. We have, that seems to me to be a structural problem. But we can all talk about how wonderful and diverse we are, but it's not being addressed. So again, this is not about organizations, which I think are great, but I just wonder if you might reflect about ways that we can translate the good feelings we're trying to create mm -hmm. into some kind of structural change in the audience. I, yeah, maybe Janet can, can weigh in as well. Um, you know, I I sort of go back to, to the Durkheimian perspective. Um, I, uh, when when we fear things or people, or, or when we fear things about people that we ascribe to them, pro properly or improperly, um, we do exclusionary things and we write them in. Uh, so I think that the one that you're uh, referencing, at least what it makes me think of, especially as I see different housing developments going up, that I keep thinking, well, that would have been a really perfect place for some low-income housing, yeah. how come that wasn't considered? And the answer is that the, uh, our elected leaders um, uh, haven't felt the pressure to do that. In fact, they felt pressure in precisely the opposite direction, because we uh, well-off people who do housing developments are afraid of poor people, or poorer people, or people of modest income. So I, I don't have an answer to that, but I certainly, I mean, I agree with you. I, I've seen it in too many places. And in fact, even in Elmwood, um, when uh, a new building was put up um, that was specifically for uh, people of more modest income, uh, certain people, including elected people, uh, fought it tooth and nail, uh, despite the fact that as it went up, and as I've seen it, since I happen to know a family that lives right across the street from it, um, it's a much nicer place than most of the other stuff around it. Uh, but we were afraid of that. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's not an answer, it's just an acknowledgement that that, that 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 is a problem that still very much exists here. Mm -hmm. well, sure, I agree with you that structural impediments are really important, structural conditions, uh, institutional cultures are so important and, and so difficult to change, even though they're important in perpetuating certain kinds of discrimination and, and inequalities. But I'm also struck by the fact that um, in, in some of the things I've been looking at recently about immigrant civic engagement and immigrant uh, support groups and so on, um, one of the key factors to immigrants participating or taking action or support groups being formed or action, political action groups being formed is some kind of threat uh, or sort of event. And I think a lot, we can see that around us with uh, the new executive orders have sort of galvanized people to want to organize, to speak out against um, certain kinds of um, what they see as discrimination or um, unfairness. And it's unfortunate that it takes those kind of events to catalyze us <coughs> to at least speak out. It doesn't solve the problem of making change uh, in our institutional cultures. There's a question here. It's about me, but I'm not belonging in this room. It's a 
In this community, there's a mosque in Hunger, Hungerford Street. There's also a large mosque in Windsor, in Medina. In three, in, in three weeks begins Ramadan. These, all these activities, all these spots are virtually, they, they go unnoticed. Yeah. Um, we get no publicity. But Salam Alaikum Ramadan to our country. Shabbat Allah, Shabbat Shalom. Is, is that what I, well, I, 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 I think you, you were making the point that we have Muslims around us, but we're, we, but nobody knows it. No, nobody knows about their presence. Um, I think that that's absolutely true. Um, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> as somebody tries to get publicity for a number of kinds of things, there's a lot of religious activity going on, on around here that we don't get publicity for. It's not, uh, it's not news uh, anymore uh, in, in all sorts of ways. And, uh, the, you know, the Sikh community that is a fair, has a lovely gurdwara um, in Southington. I don't think I've seen an article yet uh, about any of that. Uh, and I and I could go on and on to other uh, other communities as well. Um, it is amazing, though, uh, that particularly with the, the number of Muslims around and the diversity of the Muslim population, that that is not picked up on by the media very well at all. Where's the mosque? <coughs> Pardon? Why is it there a mosque in West Africa? A small one, somewhere. There, there was a, I don't think this will exist, a, a Shia mosque in the Elmwood section. Mm -hmm. It was the subject of the NYU police surveillance about several years ago. <coughs> but I don't think it's active as a mosque. It was a, more of an educational location and had classes and things like that. Yeah. People ask there, there's, 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 a a Muslim, there's a Muslim cemetery in Enfield. Yes, there is. Yes. Yes, that's true, there is. Um, the, you know, intriguingly, uh, like, and I was going to make this point earlier about um, the way that we split ourselves up religiously, um, we don't <coughs> do this as much anymore in, in Christian churches, but it used to be we, the, the Christian churches were ethnically oriented, so you had a, a German uh, evangelical reform. I, I remember, I think it was in Schenectady that had a, 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 a Polish Catholic church literally across the street from a French Catholic church. Uh, those kinds of things exist historically. Well, the same kind of thing is happening in many ways with the mosques uh, around here. There is a Bosnian mosque in Hartford that's not very far from an African-American mosque in Hartford. And that's the way they're organizing themselves because that's what feels comfortable to them, and they need to feel comfortable. There's a very good reason they need to feel comfortable right now. Um, Frank, I'm um, Senator again, and we obviously are engaged in talking about race, for sure, having this conversation, if you're curious and interested, please come to see us. I want to speak to your question about how do you talk about race, or how do you define race,
the Bristol story I think is so interesting because the No Webster House had an exhibit years ago. It's the, some of the materials on the website right now you can read it. Um, and that's where I first saw the story of Bristol too, right there. And um, the um, Booker Devon, who's a professor, retired professor here in town, is a it was part of a, the uh, was part of African American social organization. They saw the exhibit. He, it resonated with him, and they actually sponsored a replacement headstone in Center Cemetery. And the original, which is now fragile, was taken inside for protection, but it's marked. And then the site was listed on the Connecticut Freedom Trail. And so when the new school name came up, I know that Booker Devon and his wife and the West Hartford African American Social uh, Organization really felt that this would be an inspiring story. And this would tell a lot about West Hartford's history. And so I was just so thrilled that it was successful. And I believe that the original headstone is on display at the school. So it, it's right there every day for the students. So I'm going to speak as a, as a probably the only news person here about why, well, and I just cover West Hartford, but if a mosque were to open in West Hartford, that would be a great news story, just as if there are a new church opening or a new synagogue, synagogue opening. So I mean, those are the reasons why things make the news, because I don't just decide that I'm going to write about First Church because it's sitting there and been there for a while. It was having an anniversary, or, or there's some reason to write about it. We choose to write about it. But what about kind of the other side of the argument that We've gotten to the point in West Hartford, perhaps, where we don't need to highlight the differences between the the ethnic groups and the religious groups. You know, my son, who just turned 19 yesterday or the day before, went to Webster Hill Elementary School. It was an incredibly diverse environment. In fact, in the three years between his year and, and my daughter, who's three years older, it became even much more diverse. And, and I honestly don't think he noticed it. He had friends of all colors, of all religions. I don't think he realized, and I honestly don't think he realized, and to this day doesn't really pay any attention to people's religion or, or ethnicity or race unless it's brought to his, to, to his attention. So don't you think on the other side of the argument, it's not necessarily not necessary to always highlight those differences? and to just accept people for who they are. And, and that's just, that's not necessarily what I'm saying, I believe, but just something to, to think about. I think Karen um, wants to add to it. Too. I'm actually a friend of Ronnie's, and so I feel like I can disagree with her a little bit. Um, I, uh, my son also has Connor, and he's incredibly diverse. And he had friends of all races and religions. But when I look at the prom pictures, every season, they're literally all white kids. You may have one or two people at football or cross and in class with lots of different kids. But at the end of the day, the prom pictures are white. Or and then the other, there's other pictures that aren't. So I think right, they may not see color, but they still separate them themselves. Just, or at least he's he's a little he's a little yeah. <laughs> These are great questions that I, I have two thoughts about them. One is that we, we haven't touched on class at all. And I think that um, when, I, when I go to events like this and, and, and honest conversations, we're usually sort of middle class people that are showing up for these conversations. And I think about so many of the immigrant and refugee families that I work with, and some of them are in West Hartford, who don't come to these events, who people don't meet. When you meet a Muslim who's the other, you don't meet some of the more working class, less educated individuals. So, and that's a form of diversity as well. I know some African refugee kids who, who go to West Hartford schools, but I bet you they, and I know, they've never been in the home of a, another West Hartford family. And I don't think any of the kids they know from school have been to their home as well. And 
I don't know if it's still the same, but when I was in high school, you know, you went to people's homes and you did things with them. It sort of follows up on the prom uh, example. I mean, there may be some exceptions, but, um, and part of that may have to do with, you know, lifestyle and class differences between their families and other families. But part of what those kids also do is they give up part of their diversity and their culture because they're trying to be like all the other kids in West Hartford in terms of how, what they wear and how they talk and so forth. So I think when we think about preserving certain kinds of diversity, it's like home languages and cultures and things like that, there really is so much pressure. I mean, it's a, it's a good thing they can be, you know, integrate and, and sort of assimilate in that way, but it's also losing part of who they are because they're really, in their homes, they speak another language, they have to act a different way, and, and those are some of the struggles that some of the kids we don't see are going through in West Hartford. Um, and I'm not sure, we'll, I've talked a little bit to Cheryl and other people about what the school is doing to sort of support um, teachers and sort of listening to and understanding some of these things, but I'm not sure what's being done exactly on that. Thank you. 
I'm part of a group that's uh, one of the groups resettling Syrian refugees. Um, and uh, I know the number one thing that is on our refugee family's mind about West Hartford is that it is expensive to live here and they don't have very much money and that scares them a lot. Um, uh, and we hear that quite often from them for very good reason. Um, I will say one other anecdote that I, I guess I think is funny, but it's, it's a little intriguing. The kids um, pick up language uh, much faster than adults do. And this particular family has four children under the age of five. And the, the second child, who's three or four, depending on whose records you believe, um, has picked up English very, very quickly. And now he stopped talking to his father in Arabic, which just, I, I think it's kind of a game. I think this kid who was a devilish little kid um, is, just knows how to, to push his dad's buttons, and he only speaks to him in English uh, now. Which, um, I don't know if that's, if you know more stories about that or not, but. Well, I, I mean, I've seen it in other countries as well, but usually it's when kids, go, or they go to nursery school or they have contact with other kids. So some, I've seen kids who decide, because they want to be integrated into Germany or Canada or America, they will refuse to speak the, lang the home language to immerse themselves in the host country language. But then what they lose is deep communication with their parents. Uh, because they cannot speak, their parents can't speak English well enough or German well enough to communicate with their child who is trying only to speak in the host language so they will assimilate into the society that they are identifying with now. I'm not sure in that case, but sometimes that is. Yeah, I Yeah, 
I agree with uh, Terry, and having just gone to a talk at Trinity last week where um, someone gave up, it stood up and asked a, a question that was clearly prejudiced, which was they had already made up their mind about it, and then I went outside and talked with them afterwards for a while, and it's clear his mind was not open to thinking about other information. <laughs> and unfortunately, it was also probably heavily influenced by social media and websites, and you can get any kind of information out there. And that's, I think, one of the challenges, as a, as a teacher, one of my challenges is how do you sort of teach young people to look at information or get different, lots of different information and, and judge what's you know what's more or less accurate and, <laughs> and really not accurate at all, or fake news, as, as people are saying now. Uh, and in the end, I just stopped talking to this person because he was not listening. The scary thing for me is that he told me he was going to run for public office. So we'll see <laughs> if he has it. He's thinking about it. He's thinking about it. second and then probably we need to close but uh, so our dad uh, has been working at the cheesecake factory okay and we are really pushing him to, to, to learn English and he comes home and he says I, I want to be surrounded by people that speak English all of my co-workers speak Spanish <laughs> and I mean this is true throughout this region um, it's difficult to, to practice on the job and it's true for some of the schools in her the kids are speaking in Spanish, and so they can't understand their peers. Um, thank you so much. I don't know if you want to close us officially and uh, take us to the next conversation. All of us, we are small but mighty crowd tonight here. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you to Janet for being such a wonderful moderator. Thank you to our fabulous panelists. Thank you to Connecticut Humanities for funding this opportunity. Um, this is a two-part series, so the next part will be next Wednesday at the same time, same place. And um, it is about responding. So we're actually going to have Mark Overmeyer Velasquez and Jeremy Pressman, both University of Connecticut professors, um, who are going to talk about starting a grassroots movement. If, uh, if, so basically, the idea is we're talking about race and religion here, and we're learning about the background. And now the next part is if you want to respond, how do you do that? Um, so uh, those two will be talking about their grassroots grassroots movement they started. They had this big rally here that I think drew a thousand people and I'm wondering where they are tonight. They should be here. Um, and, and then we have uh, Victoria Victoria Christow who is the executive director of the um, Center for Nonviolence. 
um, he'll be talking about how how to uh, get involved in a very peaceful way. So I hope you'll join us. Thank you very much, and please. Uh,